Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Jay. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Lawrence Kazmir as well and Yael Ilmer for the technical support. As you can imagine, uh, right now we have 352 people attending this. Uh, so welcome, everyone. It's truly impressive. Uh, and we're very proud to see this turnout, especially in these troubling times. Uh, we have a lot of stuff on our minds uh, with this COVID-19 bug that's running around. And I think that uh, it's the perfect time for, uh, you know, have listen to birds, about birds, about nature, uh, because birds is what brings everyone together. And uh, I hope you all enjoy this presentation. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, it's not going to be very technical. Uh, it's going to be more of a sort of a celebration and uh, of the beauty of birds. And we're very fortunate to be living in a country where, you know, even when we're quarantined or confined to our own home, if you go outside, we're going to see birds. So I'm just going to share this uh, screen of the presentation and we'll get going. All right, without further ado. So when uh, people that know a little bit about nature, a little bit about birds, uh, think about Israel, this is usually what they think about, this uh, magnificent, magnificent migration uh, of millions of birds migrating through Israel. In this case, we see a flock of uh, white storks. This is a small part of a flock of 14,000 white storks that uh, landed in the Bet She'an Valley in the northern uh, part of the Rift Valley in Israel. And this is a daily thing uh, during late August and early September. Storks start migrating very, very early in the season. Like I said, while we're here in deep summer still with very high temperatures, storks leave their breeding grounds in Europe and Western Asia and start moving uh, south towards Africa. Uh, nearly 80% of the world population of white storks migrates through Israel. Uh, they gather together in these massive flocks. Uh, they always stop in this particular area in the Bet She'an Valley in northern Israel. And they spend the night there, relax a little bit, and then the following day, they take off and continue on their migration. If you look at this map back from 1581, then Israel and Jerusalem specifically were considered to be the center of the world. Now, we'd like to think that we still are the center of the world. At least we make enough media noise uh, to think that we're the center of the world. Uh, of course, when you look back at these times, then uh, Israel was considered to be the center of the world because of religious and political uh, historical uh, connections. But this uh, very simplistic illustration actually explains very well why Israel is such an amazing place for bird migration and for birds in general. It's because we are the land bridge connecting the three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa. If we look at a little more uh, detailed map, it's still a bit schematic, but you get the picture. You get birds that migrate from far uh, into Asia, all that nest in this Eurasian landmass. Hundreds of millions of birds migrate down to Africa every winter, and they choose the fastest route possible without passing obstacles. So in this case, you can see a lot in the center, Israel being that land bridge right here that little sliver of land uh, just east of the Mediterranean Sea. You can see how birds that nest in Western Europe, for example, in this area here, instead of flying directly over the Mediterranean Sea, some do some island hopping through here. But birds prefer not to cross large bodies of water. Large bodies of water, it's very simple. Stopping means death in many, many cases. Soaring birds, don't migrate over water because thermals, the hot air thermal that rises from the ground, 
does not develop over water. So they cannot migrate over large bodies of water. And for the smaller guys, everything, you know, the songbirds, many of the water birds, waterfowl, choose not to fly over the Mediterranean Sea. Again, because there is no efficient stopover sites. There are birds that do cross the Mediterranean Sea. And I don't know if any of you have ever been on a boat a deep in the Mediterranean Sea during the migration seasons, then a lot of these birds stop on vessels a, and sort of rest and hitch a ride. But most of the birds, as you can see, choose to go around the Mediterranean Sea, through Israel, down to Africa, where they spend the winter months. And then in the spring, right now actually, they fly right back up following the Rift Valley through Israel and back north to Europe and Asia through their breeding grounds. Now, if we look at a more scientific oriented map, this is a map that was generated uh, via hundreds of thousands of observation points on eBird during the migration season. eBird, for those of you that are not familiar with it, it is an amazing system developed by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And it's the biggest birding citizen science uh, platform there is in the world. And you can see here very, very nicely, the nice bright pink are the my biggest migration corridors in the world. So if we look at the Americas, we've got the big Atlantic flyway right here. Birds moving from their breeding grounds in North America and Canada and the Northern US, migrating south to Central America and further south. And you see our amazing migration corridor. You can see birds that have left here, Central and Western Europe and slowly work their way, all funneling down through Israel on their way to Africa. And I like this uh, map because it also shows the really big desert block, what we call, from North Africa, this whole area, the Sahara Desert. If you have the Mediterranean here and then immediately after the Sahara Desert, we're talking about some pretty rough habitat that birds need to migrate over. And they fly all the way south. They're, it's called trans-Saharan migrants. These are birds that cross the Sahara Desert and reach a more fertile area just further south where you see the green bit, an area called the Sahel and further south where they spend the winter months. A little bit about uh, our organization, Society for the Protection of Nature in Israel, SPNI in short. It was founded in 1953. We are the BirdLife International partner in Israel. BirdLife International is the big biggest birding conservation organization in the world. It's a partner organization with representatives in over 100 countries. SCNI are the partner in Israel. We are also the largest environmental NGO in Israel, and we have 36,000 registered members. The founding of SPNI is a result of one of the biggest ecological catastrophes on the one hand, but Israel's first pioneering project on the other. Back in the day, there was a lake called the Hula Lake, the historic Hula Lake. It was a huge wetland, a big lake in the center, surrounded by marshes and brackish areas. And this wetland in Northern Israel was one of the most important wetlands for biodiversity, for birds and other wildlife in the whole Middle East. There were huge numbers of uh, breeding birds here, a lot of very interesting uh, wildlife besides birds. Um, and in Israel's early days, there was a serious need to clear areas for agriculture. So Israel's first government decided that they're going to drain the Hula Lake. There were several attempts throughout history, or at least initiatives, to try and dry the Hula Lake even before but it was Israel's young days and personal backing of David Ben-Gurion himself that decided that they'll go ahead and dry the Hula Lake. And so the project started when Israel was a very, very young country. And at the time, of course, conservation was not something that people worried about. But even back then, there were a few young students, biology students that Pro protested against this plan to dry the Hula Lake. They alerted that if they do this, it will be an ecological catastrophe, that we cannot afford to lose this amazing pearl of nature in Northern Israel. 
And uh, these people that included Professor Amot Zahavi and Azari Alon and Uzi Paz and a few others, um, they're the ones that, you know, raised the flag of conservation back then. But sadly, like I said, this thing was backed fully by the Israeli government and the project uh, happened. As a result of drying the Hula Lake, this beautiful amphibian you see uh, on the right hand, on the bottom right, it's called the Hula Painted Frog. This frog uh, was extinct or thought to be. When the lake was dried, this frog disappeared and was thought to be extinct from nature until in, uh, I think it was 2011, a small population of these frogs were found again in the Hula Nature Reserve, which is really amazing. The Hula Nature Reserve was the first nature reserve in Israel. And this iconic conservation battle in Israel's early days was what led to the founding of the Society for the Protection of Nature in Israel. This is what we do in a nutshell. Our job is first and foremost, of course, to protect nature. We conserve habitats, we try to restore habitats, and we try to create new habitats, especially in these, you know, rapid development uh, days. It's very, very important that we create habitats and take care of them. We have a, an intensive monitoring uh, department with people running around all over the country carrying out field work. And more important, we have a large chapter that deals with education, creating awareness, to wide and diverse public, and we manage public campaigns. Now, I mentioned before that we're an NGO. There are several other green parties in Israel, but they're more affiliated with the government. The fact that the Society for Protection of Nature is an NGO basically means that we can go head to head with the government seriously when we think that something is wrong. And, it, and SPNI carries a lot of weight in public campaigns and with decision making. Within SPNI is our little branch, BirdLife Israel, and this is the stuff that we do mainly. We have a monitoring department, again, people carrying out field work. These people are out in the field collecting data. Actually, a lot of the team is still doing it even these days under these uh, crazy situations. They're still out there doing the field work because we need to collect this data now when the breeding season is on, when the migration season is on. We cannot wait for this outbreak to, you know, to calm down. There's stuff that we need to collect now because decisions have to be made very, very quickly and they have to be based on hard data. When we come to a developer that wants to build a new neighborhood on the outskirts of, a, I don't know, of the city of Modi'in or they want to expand some other place into natural areas, we need to have the data in hand in order to come up to these decision makers and say, look, this is data from the field, from now, and this is what we suggest you do and what we expect you not to do. That's the main uh, duty of our monitoring department. We have an outreach and conservation uh, department, people that deal with education mainly. We have programs in many, many schools in Israel, tens of thousands of students, and we deal with a lot of outreach and public affairs. And we have our tourism branch, I'm the director, Director of our tourism branch, and uh, this is birding tourism. Birding tourism is a very thing uh, on traveling to watch nature and birds. And in recent years, our birding tourism uh, events and tours have become uh, one of the most important uh, engines or fuel for our budgets. Our birding tours, we operate as a full-on tour operator. We offer uh, packages door-to-door -door from the airport, be it half a day tour up to two weeks tours. And uh, the money that is generated from these tours does not go into anyone's direct pocket, but rather the money that is raised from the tourism department is funneled right into our monitoring and research or outreach departments. So this is what we do. Back to migration. The sun started heating up the ground in the Jordan Valley. You can see the hills of Jordan in the background and the flock of storks it took off and started moving along the Rift Valley. But it's not just storks, of course. 
In this picture, uh, we see a small part of a massive group of uh, European honey buzzards migrating over the Eilat Mountains. European honey buzzards are a very, very special bird of prey. You can see them, you can see it here. It's a very dainty bird of prey. As it implies from its name, honey buzzard, this is a bird of prey that's unique because it eats bees, hornets, and it actually also eats the honeycomb from the actual hives of uh, wild bees. It's really a fascinating bird of prey. You can and see by its feet, it's so dainty. It doesn't really, it's not aggressive like other raptors. It doesn't, you know, swoop down and, you know, claw at stuff. It's a very, very special uh, bird of prey. You can see also, it's a bit hard to see, but uh, it's got a very special shape of nostril, an elongated nostril with a slight flap covering it. So it could stick its head right in there in the beehives uh, without fear of being stung or inhaling uh, any insects. So this magnificent bird of prey, 85% of the world population of this magnificent bird of prey migrates through Israel. Now they do this in a very, very tight period of time. We're talking about, about 400,000, 450,000 uh, European honey buzzards that migrate through Israel within a 20 day period. It's quite amazing. Right now, they're still in Africa. These guys take their time they start moving north in uh, about early April, um, mid-April, and they pass us in the third week of April and into May. Within those 20 days, half a million uh, honey buzzards. It's truly amazing. Another very important bird that's getting also a lot of positive press in recent times is the steppe eagle. Step eagle is an amazing large Aquila eagle, a very, very impressive bird of prey that uh, nests in the steppes of Kazakhstan in Asia. And uh, nearly a large chunk of the world population uh, migrates through Israel. Now, why is it important to monitor birds such as step eagles uh, here in Israel? Because our counts in Israel give us the best estimate of the whole world population of this species and some others. Because if you wanted to study the breeding pairs in the Asian steppe, you would need to go into Kazakhstan and further east and start driving miles and miles and miles searching for these birds during the breeding season. And you'll find a pair here and a pair there and a small number here and there. It will be impossible to assess uh, the size of the world population. But if you sit in the Eilat Mountains right now then, and look up and count every single steppe eagle that migrates over your head moving north, that actually gives us the best estimate of the number of steppe eagles there are. And that's why it's so important to count uh, steppe eagles and other birds of prey and soaring birds in general in Israel because it gives us the best outlook on the whole population. This is a steppe eagle that I photographed over the Eilat Mountains. This guy spent four months in Africa and now he's on his way back to Kazakhstan. But it's not all about the big guys. You know, these, this is a small example, a small collection of the real heroes of migration. You know, the large, large birds of prey, storks, pelicans, cranes, eagles, other soaring birds are very, very impressive. A lot of us got hooked on birding by looking at these large, impressive birds. The sight of a huge flock of storks or a flock of birds of prey moving through is something that you will never forget. But they're not the real heroes of migration. You know, if they rely on these air thermals that I mentioned before, they, they rely on the weather conditions to be good. And if the weather conditions aren't just right, these guys will take a rest. But the little guys, if we look here, we've got a common red start, we've got an Orphean warbler, common kingfisher, red-backed and masked shrike, Rufus bush robin, blue throat coming to us from Sweden and uh, Northern Europe. These guys weighing just a little bit more than a, a packet of ketchup that you get at McDonald's. These little guys fly thousands and thousands of kilometers by wing power, sheer wing power at night mainly, on their own, or in loose flocks, 
these are the real heroes of migration. It's staggering. It's, it's truly unbelievable to think that a bird that weighs, I don't know, 15 grams or something is able to leave the hedge where it hatched in Poland or in Hungary uh, or in Germany to fly all the way down south of the Sahara into deep into Africa, spend some time there, again, by sheer wind power. They, they don't harness the winds and the thermals just like the big guys. These guys have to power it out. And they migrate to Africa, they spend the winter there, and then they fly all the way back and end up in the same place where they hatched or in the same, the, in the vicinity. And they're gonna try and uh, raise another generation there. I mean, it's truly mind boggling to think. There's so many questions that come up from this amazing migration of songbirds. I mean, I, I'm not even talking about the anatomy, the, the how do they do it, you know, <laughs> with their organs, they're so small, and I'm not even looking at navigation, you know, navigation, it's truly, truly amazing. So we're very lucky uh, to live in Israel, and uh, here we have a, a orange tufted or Palestine sunbird, this was shot in my yard, now this is the closest thing that we have to, uh, you know, the Calibri group, a sunbird. It's the only sunbird that we have in Israel, and it's a serious contender for Israel's smallest bird. And Israel, because it's truly a birding paradise, and that's because size doesn't really matter in this case. Israel is only 320 miles top to bottom, just under 500 kilometers and about 70 kilometers or 75, 80 kilometers at the widest point uh, east to west. Now within this very, very tiny country, we have a huge diversity of habitats. If we look at the Mediterranean coast, then we have a wild coast, a very nice beach line. And nowadays there's a lot of fish pond complexes replacing natural habitat. Uh, uh, which are good, but also bring conflict, which I will touch a bit later. But the bottom line is that it's a very lush and important habitat. In the far north, we've got Mount Hermon, Israel's only uh, true alpine habitat. Mount Hermon is 2,200 meters above sea level, hosting a nice array uh, of species that nest only there. If you go for further south, we've got the West Negev, which is a semi-desert. It's not a really dry desert. Uh, nowadays, it's got steppe natural habitat, but also very, very elaborate uh, agricultural areas. And as you move for, further south uh, to the, through the Negev Desert, it becomes drier and drier, and the climate becomes harsher until you reach the Gulf of Eilat, uh, Eilat itself with the Eilat mountain chain and the opening of the Red Sea. So within this very, very small country, we've got a huge uh, diversity of habitats and every one of these habitats, of course, uh, holds its own array of species. Israel is also a meeting of zootopical zones. This basically means that we've got representatives from Asia, western point of distribution, such as this right through the uh, and Asian jungle cat. Of course, this uh, medium zoological zone does not relate only to birds, but uh, to flora, fauna, to the whole uh, biodiversity. So we've got represent representatives from Asia at their westernmost point in the world. We've got European species, such as this uh, Mediterranean species, such as this uh, European eater, and European green finch, and Israel is about the most in the world with the nest, and we're also the Namakwa dove and golden jackal with a crane leg for those that were thinking. So you died, someone's died. All right. You muted yourself. Uh, 
Uh, hi everyone. I think we've lost uh, Jonathan for a second. So um, just sorry for the. I, do you hear me now? Yeah, you just come back. So just um, put yourself back and on the you, screen. And you'll be able to. Continue. Sorry. Do you, do you still see my screen, or do I need to reshare it? Uh, you need to reshare your screen. Okay, guys. Sorry about that. I think Jonathan is having an audio problem. Jonathan, are you back? Uh, Sorry, guys. I'm much less interested than Jonathan. Thank you, everyone, for all the questions. Um, I'm seeing loads of questions in the uh, chat, and we'll answer all the questions at the end. Um, so just uh, put them all in. I'm making notes, and then we'll uh, pass on to Jonathan. And he's back. I'm back. Yeah, you're back. One second. You here? I we can see your screen, but not you. I'm back. You, yeah, you, I can hear you. So keep talking, and you'll come back eventually. And hopefully, I can. These people. Right. Are, um, Jonathan, Jonathan, are you there? All right, guys, sorry about the technical difficulties. Uh, you can imagine that uh, <laughs> Yes, I'm there. Yeah, okay, so keep going. They don't need to see me anymore. Bye, everyone. Thank you for coming. Can you not hear me? No, they can hear you. Everyone can hear you. You're just very, your incense very bad. You on a Tam? Uh, hi everyone, uh, Jonathan's just uh, vanished again. Um, this is what happens when you're in a startup nation and the tech is really, really great. Okay, he's coming back now. Jonathan's back now. Um, yeah, Jonathan, I see you. You're muted though, can't hear you. All right, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, let me get back to this. All right, we're back, right? Uh, yeah, you just need to, yeah, you're back. Yeah, keep going. Okay, guys, I'm sorry. Um, just remarkable. If you the all of us, America, the list once we have fish countries of New Jersey, so that's really remarkable. Start the Hebrew. This table basically shows the, the number of births once in square kilometer. So if you look at Israel, that is about 24,000 kilometers in size, we have 540. Uh, Jonathan, you've muted yourself, but I think you need to turn the video off and um, just show you the screen. As, as attractive as you are, I think people want to see the slideshow more than you. Okay, can you hear me now? Um, yeah. Yeah, just turn your screen. I'm going to turn your video off and just focus on the, uh, the screen and then that was much better. Okay, so um, you know, so I'm keep um, going, and we'll try and uh, cut out the volume. And if not, we'll um, maybe move to question and answers uh, a bit quicker. Um, can you? Yeah, yeah, you're much. Yeah, I think so. I think if you keep okay. giving, keep going, then we'll so do it. we've got 500, 505 species, twenty point five species per one thousand summer. The same uh, relates to uh, plant species. 
if you look at this, it's truly remarkable. And the four kilometer area of Indra is about. Uh, hi everyone. Um, it appears that Yonatan's internet's really unstable. Um, I think we're going to just have a pause for um, a couple of minutes to see whether we can get him back and then we'll make a sort of an executive decision whether we're going to continue or not. So if you just um, bear with us um, for a couple of uh, minutes and we'll see how we can uh, do. Um, otherwise, um, I see everyone's leaving, but please be patient. Um, otherwise, um, our next lecture is going to be uh, with Shmita Yidvab, who's our Director of Mammals. Um, and that's going to be on Sunday, the 12th of April. So we hope to see you all then and we'll uh, send you out um, another email reminder. I um, just really want to thank you all for, for joining us um, today. And I hope you're all staying well, safe uh, in this. In this I'm, I'm back. If we can. Uh, you're on back. So we're going to go. Um, we'll keep going. You don't need me. But. Go yeah, on. let's keep going, guys. I'm really, really sorry about this, uh, but I think we'll carry on uh, right now. So, the diversity of plant species is truly remarkable as well. And wrong enough, Israel has a number of things. This is the Your terms of adventure is as the sun, as earth is the science the that was through land. And the name for Tolda is Tomatsui. Tomatsui means the common love. Sadly, the situation with this dove is not very good and it's not as it used to be. But it's true in of spring. Fur ones are now returning from Africa after having the winter and out, are now coming back to Israel to be the uh, okay. Um, hi everyone. Um, I think it's. Um, um, I think that the technical uh, problems um, have um, is a shame, and also you see me without shaving. Um, I'm. Uh, I hope you uh, guys enjoyed the uh, at least the beginning of the presentation. Um, we'll set. And uh, that that poo poo pretty much says all says all. I think. Um, uh, I, I think we're gonna I uh, will try and come back again. Um, we'll try and we'll try and get Jonathan back to uh, give um, to continue his presentation maybe another evening. But I think it's I, now uh, I'm I'm here. I think we should try one You wanna try one, one more time? time? You keep crap you keep dropping off after two minutes. So um it's um, I'm not really doing anything different here, so uh, I, I think okay, try one more time, uh, Jay. Uh, we'll, we'll try and get Yonatan back to uh, give uh, to continue his presentation maybe another evening. Yes, for sure. Uh, I'm, I'm here. I think we should try one, we'll try one more time. So you keep crapping, you keep dropping off after two minutes. So uh, one more time. It's, um, I'm not really doing anything different here, so. Uh, I, I think I All right, guys. Um, one of the most amazing species that we Jonathan, have. Uh, Jonathan, are you there? The hoopo, the hoopo as well is. Uh, yes, I'm there. You're just hearing me in delay. Lawrence. Yeah, I'm here. I'm listening to you. Um, people, All right, so we people still are still here, a, so keep going, keep going. Yeah, guys, truly, I'm, I'm very, very sorry for this. Uh, we'll try to go uh, as much as we can. So because Israel is such a small country and we're in the middle of this amazing migration corridor, then migration in Israel is evident everywhere. 
This common quail I photographed on the beach in Tel Aviv in the middle of a parking lot. I came down there early in the morning one day uh, and I saw this guy running around between uh, the cars. You can see the, t the car tire back here, but truly everywhere in the country uh, now, these days we can witness amazing migration. This is a bird called a wryneck. It nests deep in the forests of uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Wrynecks are very, very hard to see with this cryptic pattern. Very, very frustrating. And uh, it's truly remarkable that in Israel during migration, you can see them in parks and in the middle of the city. It's truly amazing. And again, another example of how migration truly is everywhere. Overall, we've got 2 million soaring birds that pass over Israel every year. This is the lesser spotted eagle. The whole world population of lesser spotted eagles migrates over Israel, especially in the fall, in a very, very tight period of time, the whole world population. And it all happens within minutes from the biggest metropolis in Tel Aviv. I live about 20 minutes, half an hour east of Tel Aviv on the foothills of Jerusalem. And these guys, uh, during the migration season in the fall, always come down uh, and roost in the forest, the Ben Shemin forest, which is right next to our house. And it's truly amazing to see these guys uh, come down in the evening, spend one night, and you can see these are shots uh, from the takeoff of these eagles in the morning. It's truly a remarkable thing and very, very close uh, to Tel Aviv. Very, very easy to see. This is a nice uh, radar shot uh, from the radar in the Ben Gurion airport. And this radar shot shows a stream of lesser spotted eagles. You can see this stream is tens of kilometers long from north of Tel Aviv all the way down to Ashdod. This line is a line of migrating lesser spotted eagles. Truly, truly amazing covering the whole airspace. We've got about 50,000 white pelicans, the whole European population of white pelicans that migrates through Israel as well. A very, very amazing birds, three meter wingspan. Look at this amazing shot by Yossi Eshbol. And back to my little neck of the woods, a birding tourism as a generator of funds. This is a picture of uh, one of our groups during the Eilat Birds Festival. We operate uh, the Eilat Birds Festival has been going on uh, for since 2007, uh, 12 years. And today, was, this year was the first time we had to cancel it, sadly, uh, because of the situation. But the Eilat Birds Festival is well known, has become a, a true anchor of our birding tourism. Uh, and in the fall, we also have a, we don't call it the Hula Bird Festival anymore, but we also have a very nice uh, seven-day program focused around the Hula Valley, that magical place, which you'll see a little bit more of uh, very, very soon. Now again, our bird festivals and bird tours uh, generate very, very important income. During the fall and winter, a lot of our birding activities focuses on the Hula Valley. The Hula hosts 40,000 uh, common cranes every winter. This is a small example uh, of the cranes in the Hula. And a very cool thing that you can do in the Hula is the mobile hide. Look at this, this is truly amazing. Um, it's a wagon, it was an idea of a farmer called Eli Galili years ago. He said, he noticed that when he worked in the fields, the cranes uh, did not, not mine. So he said, you know what, why don't I attach behind my tractor, instead of attaching some large agricultural machinery, I'll attach a, a wagon, a mobile hide. He started with a small one for only a few people and it grew and grew. And nowadays these wagons can take 50 people at a time into the area where the cranes feed. And it's truly remarkable. Uh, you get very, very close to the cranes I'm sure a lot of you uh, have done it before. Uh, those of you that, that were with us here in Israel uh, or visited the Hula Valley on your own, 
try to do the mobile hide. If you haven't, you have to do it. This is truly a, an experience of a lifetime. The Khula is also an amazing place for uh, birds of prey, especially in winter. Uh, this Eastern Imperial Eagle, a very, very rare bird worldwide, only a, a few thousand pairs uh, left. And uh, this guy is very, very easy to see uh, in the Khula Valley in winter. Same goes for this uh, greater spotted eagle. Again, a bird which is in uh, danger, well, not, not critical yet, but a small number of pairs breeding around the world. Not easy to see, but the Hula Valley can host uh, up to 100 of these guys in the winter. And it's truly one of the best places in the world to get up close and personal with this very, very impressive bird of prey. But my little uh, passion, is really uh, the desert, especially uh, the Negev Desert. We see, uh, this is the view from Sde Boker, from the Ben Gurion Memorial Park. Look at this amazing uh, biblical uh, scene of uh, Wadi Tzin in the middle. And the Negev Desert is truly remarkable uh, for birds. We've got quite a few species of wheat ears, such as this uh, white crowned black wheat ear, morning wheat ear, and black start. These are common residents uh, in our deserts. Arabian green bee eaters. This is a true gem of the desert and a garden bird uh, for many people living in the desert. They're very, very common. Uh, they've learned to live alongside uh, humans. And uh, I mean, not much to say, this bird sells itself. One of the other jewels of the crown is the amazing McQueen's Bustard. This is a turkey-sized bird, uh, and Israel has the last remaining uh, wild population of this bird uh, in the Middle East. It used to roam the deserts of the Middle East. Sadly, it was wiped out uh, by hunting through most of its range. In Israel, uh, we still have a decent number of pairs restricted to areas which are mainly either military or uh, near nature reserves, in nature reserves. So luckily uh, in Israel, you can still see McQueen's bustards uh, fairly easily. Uh, again, a truly remarkable bird. Along the same habitat uh, where the McQueen's bustard live, a uh, cream colored coursers nest. A uh, cream colored courser is a very, very special uh, shorebird, if you may. Uh, that specializes in this steppe-like uh, desert areas. These guys have just returned uh, to their breeding grounds and should be uh, starting to nest any day now. When we go a bit further south, uh, uh, we've got the big open valleys uh, of the southern Negev Plateau. an area that hosts a wide diversity of such as this beautiful Temminx lark. Temminx lark is a relative of uh, the horned lark uh, or shore lark as you call them uh, in Europe. Uh, and there's nothing like uh, sitting in the desert very, very early in the morning and listening to the fluting call uh, of Temminx lark uh, rolling uh, through the plains, truly memorable. Another enigmatic bird is this uh, terrestrial parrot called a thick-billed lark really amazing bird. Uh, this is a, an eruptive species that we don't really know. We haven't yet figured out the patterns of uh, where to find them. They're not common, but what we do know is that following rainy events and rainy winters, uh, these birds sort of fly into an area uh, and breed very, very quickly. They've got one of the fastest breeding cycles in nature. And uh, this year, there's quite a few thick-billed larks around in Southern Israel. Um, but uh, basically, again, uh, <laughs> it speaks for itself. I mean, look at this bill. It's adapted to deal with even the hardest of the desert seeds. Um, and the fact that it's rare and not easy to find only adds to the, to the enigma and to the passion of finding these guys in the southern deserts. Sinai rose finch or pale rose finch. Uh, an inhabit of the mountains of southern Israel. Uh, again, one of the gems. 
And we've got some very, very cool night birds. Um, on the top right is a desert tawny owl, uh, formerly known as Hume's owl. Uh, there was some uh, taxonomic uh, work being done on the species in past years, and it was reassigned taxonomically and renamed. It's now called a uh, desert owl or desert tawny owl. This is a bird that prophet Isaiah mentions in the Old Testament as a white owl living in the Judea desert. And until this day, uh, they live in the same canyons in the Judean desert. A really, really cool owl. Uh, requires special permits to go and see because it lives deep in the canyons in the nature reserves. And uh, SPNI are probably the only people that could take you uh, to see a desert tawny owl if and when you come to Israel. And the bird on the bottom left is a Nubian nightjar. Nubian nightjar is a bird, again, you know nightjars, uh, relatives of your uh, nighthawk or uh, whippoorwills in North America. Uh, amazing birds hawking around for insects. Nubian nightjar nests uh, in a very, very uh, restricted area in the Southern Dead Sea, Southern Judean Desert. It's really into that marsh, uh, salt marsh habitat. Actually, there's work being done. Uh, this Nubian nightjar is probably a separate species from the Nubian nightjars of East Africa. These guys uh, need this tamarisks nests in the area of tamarisks and salt marsh, uh, and we think it should be called tamarisk nightjar. All right, so uh, we'll wrap it up here. So how can you help us? First of all, if you don't know it already, then go to www.birds.org.il. This is the Israel Birds portal. It's got amazing information. It's both in Hebrew and in English. Uh, the English version has got endless amounts of information fantastic articles uh, from the best birders in the country, a couple of interesting blogs to follow, uh, daily updates, rarity alerts, um, and all kinds of the bird encyclopedia of Israel. Very, very uh, interesting. So I highly recommend uh, to go to Birds or Gael if you do not know it yet, you'll get addicted. Mustn't forget that Birds uh, or Gael also hosts our live raptor nest cams. We've got a uh, nests that we follow with these special online cameras 24 seven. Uh, at the moment we're broadcasting from three different uh, nests, a uh, griffin vulture, short-toed eagle, and long-legged buzzard. And this will give you a truly intimate and special uh, outlook at the lives of these amazing, amazing birds. Also, uh, I remind you that uh, we are an NGO. And we, a large part of our budget uh, relies on your support. So we're very happy if you go in and place a donation, do sign up to our e-newsletter, and when we can travel, which I really, really hope it's sooner than later, we'll be more than happy if you can join uh, our bird tours here in Israel. So I want to thank you and I want to wish you all a very good health and hopefully, you know, the situation uh, improves uh, sooner than later. Um, I'm very, very sorry for the technical issues. Um, it's the first time uh, we're handling a large webinar like this. So I really hope you enjoyed uh, what you heard. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing you guys uh, next time around. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan, so much um, for that. Um, if uh, Jonathan, um, I assume you're, you're still there, good. Um, can you uh, give your contact details, please? Because um, we've been asked for that. No, I, Jonathan, are you there? Jonathan, I can't hear you at all. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, I don't know what's happened to Jonathan. He seems to have frozen in time. Uh, but really, thank you all the people who are making donations. I can see them uh, all flooding in. Really, really appreciate your support at this uh, really difficult time. And it really means uh, so much uh, 
really so much to us um, that you you know that you know that you're uh, supporting us at this uh, time of technical uh, of uh, uncertainty. I'm hoping you know, so we'll come back for some questions um, if we're lucky. Um, I, I'm just coming back, so I've got a few uh, questions. I sent uh, some qu people are writing questions throughout the presentation, and uh, hopefully, you know, so I'll be able to answer some questions. Um, we're going to send the um, the video and the link uh, and all the links uh, to everyone. Hopefully, tomorrow, if I guess. Um, or a bit later on tonight, or definitely by Sunday. And uh, again, thank you very much. Jonathan, you're back? Yes, I'm here. Uh, so would you like to answer some questions? And uh, we hope that uh, you'll come visit us in Israel and uh, you know, we'll send information for the Berlin tours and uh, Jonathan, we'll hope you'll be out in the field with you guys uh, sooner rather than later. All right, so uh, a few of the greatest variety of birds, but uh, the most impressive time by far is spring uh, from mid-March uh, to mid-May. That's when uh, we have quite a lot of tours. By the way, we work with uh, a lot of the uh, biggest tour companies around the world, uh, Victor Emanuel, Nature Tours, uh, Field Guides. Uh, we work with quite a few companies in Europe and in North America. Uh, we are basically their ground agents, so you can either come through them or uh, we offer uh, our festival and events. We've got the ultimate migration tour in the fall. But again, both migration seasons are awesome, but for a first time visit, and if you want huge diversity and large numbers, then I recommend late March to mid-May, which fits well with Easter and Passover usually. Uh, let's see what other questions uh, we have here. Uh, best place to see golden orioles? Well, golden orioles don't nest in Israel, um, or they are very, very rare uh, breeders in Israel, uh, and they're very, very shy on migration. So there are much better places to go see golden orioles uh, than Israel. And, 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 uh, cooperation with Arabic states. Um, well, we work with anyone that's willing to work uh, with us. We have a very nice uh, project going on with uh, the Palestinians and with the Jordanians around the nest boxes. We've got the nest box project, basically nest boxes that are put up for barn owls in agricultural areas. Um, there are nest boxes spread out through um, Israel, uh, the Palestinian territories, and into Jordan, around the border triangle uh, in the Jordan Valley. And this is a truly amazing project that's working very, very well. Uh, at the moment, we don't have many other projects, but we do have things that we do uh, under the table or through mediators uh, with Arabic countries uh, around us. And like I said, there's, when it comes to birds, they know no boundaries and they don't deal with politics. So we're happy to work with uh, whoever wants to uh, work with us. Um, okay. Um, you know, should I read you some questions? Would that be a bit easier? Yeah, yeah, we could do that. Okay, so I saw a really great question. Um, have we collaborated with the ostrich reintroduction attempts from uh, Haibar and Yopata? Well, SPNI did not collaborate with it, but I must say that I personally was uh, involved in this project. It was in 2003 or four, if I recall correctly. Um, and it was a big mess. <laughs> I mean, they... Uh, uh, the, yeah, it didn't, it didn't really succeed. So I don't think there's going to be any attempt to try and reintroduce ostriches anytime soon. Um, how, uh, is there a danger to um, a aeroplanes from the bird flight paths? What, the fact that now there's less air traffic? That's what the... Uh, in general, like from the big migration, like all the flocks of birds are colliding with aircrafts, uh, someone asking yeah, on... So this the the partnership with the israeli air force is something that has been going on for over 30 years it was started with a uh, professor yossi leshem's work um, back in the early 80s and uh, you can imagine and i spoke to you about the huge numbers of soaring birds and other migrants moving through the israeli airspace um, and israel has a tiny airspace 
space to begin with. So you can imagine there's a lot of conflict there. And in the past, there were indeed quite a lot of collisions uh, between uh, jets and soaring birds. Nowadays, based on many, many years of studies and joint projects, uh, we're able to map, we basically know uh, the exact migration routes. And during the migration seasons, the Air Force takes extra precautions uh, in order to avoid dangerous areas and to avoid collisions uh, with yeah, birds. So, so knock on wood, you know, we're very, very lucky that there aren't many collisions uh, anymore. Um, I think we'll just go with uh, one last question um, for the evening before we wrap up. So I've got a couple of questions here about vultures and gamla. If you like to yeah, talk about Yeah, I can see there's a few questions about the vultures and gamla. So gamla and the Golan uh, was uh, one of the most important uh, breeding areas for griffin vultures in Israel. Sadly, this is not the case anymore. Uh, vultures in Israel suffered from various issues, but the main thing was poisonings up in the Golan Heights, both in the Israeli side of the Golan and in Syria. Uh, sadly, quite a few vultures from Gamla uh, got uh, poisoned and died. Others died from electrocution um, and others uh, suffered from disturbance to nests. So sadly, Gamla, which until 20, 25 years ago, hosted dozens and dozens of pairs of griffin vultures, now that's more or less done. So there's a lot of work being done with vulture uh, reintroduction programs right now we, with the Nature and Parks Authority and Chaibar Carmel. Uh, they're doing amazing things uh, to try and uh, bring back uh, the Northern Israel griffin vulture populations uh, and it'll work. So uh, we're hopeful. Okay. So I guess that's a wrap, Lawrence, Jonathan. I think uh, yeah, I think again, I'm, sorry. Ahead. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, we'll get better at this. But I think the crowd wants you again, an encore presentation, Jonathan. Yeah. So uh, I, hope, I hope we'll be able to schedule that and we'll be scheduling your colleagues, both the birders and uh, our mammal expert on April 12th, as Lawrence mentioned, we'll be sending out information about that. The link to this, talk will be uh, online and we're going to send it out as soon as we have it uh, tomorrow maybe or Sunday and uh, thank everybody for joining from all over the world uh, I don't know over 500 600 participants I think at the peak uh, still 230 with us on zoom I don't know how many on Facebook and uh, we're really uh, we're really glad to see everybody and get all the questions we're going to try to answer all the questions we can that came in on the both on the chat and in the question area. Uh, be in touch with us. We're always here keeping the candle burning uh, for Israeli nature until we're all back out enjoying it. So signing off from uh, Tel Aviv and uh, the environs, uh, wishing everybody uh, to be safe, to be safe, stay inside and uh, have a uh, Shabbat Shalom. Goodbye to everybody. Bye everyone. Namaste. Bye.